using social engineering at work. Uh, I am. Nothing. We did a sound check, I swear. like a full audio test earlier from the back, from the front. I don't, I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Sure. I will use the mic. Is this better? Okay. I'll take this thing off. Just let it hang. Actually, that's a bad idea.
Okay. Actual good morning. Good morning. Yay! Okay. So today we're going to talk about using positive influence at work to uh, get stuff done. Um, so uh, the, this is a little bit geared toward introverts, um, at least at the beginning, but um, I get more into technical ways to um, to uh, work with people and engineer uh, choices and things like that later. So um, this was me for most of my adult life. I would take the stairs instead of the elevator because I didn't want to make small talk with people. It was super awkward. I didn't know what to say. I was just, I was terrified of it. And it was only like one flight of stairs. It was like the shortest elevator I'd ever ride anywhere. So, um, so if I've been hacking myself for a couple years, um, trying to get better at peopling. And if I can do it, I mean, I was like, uh, debilitatingly introverted. <laughs> like I would cry instead of go to parties. So if I can do this and be standing up here and like talking to people and making small talk and chatting up strangers, then anybody can do it. So um, I have, I was over overcompensating for a while with certifications because I didn't have my degree yet and then it just turned into kind of a joke. So these are my credentials. <laughs> um, since I've been uh, speaking publicly, uh, this is uh, all the places that I've traveled around the world to speak. Um, I, I'm amazed by this. I would have never thought that this would happen to me like 10 years ago or even five years ago. So you can hack yourself and you can learn better, be better with humans. Um, if, even if you are comfortable making small talk and chatting with people and things like that, um, you can get better at it and you can learn how to get things via social engineering and social engineering tactics. But like anything, you do have to practice it. Um, it is something that if it doesn't come naturally, just like learning a coding language or anything else, you do have to practice it, learn it, get better at it. You're not going to be perfect on the first day. So a running theme of at least the Wellness Village and some other talks is imposter syndrome. Once you realize that basically everybody has some level of imposter syndrome, not even necessarily in this industry, but especially in this industry, and especially um, at work, then you will start to feel better about your own imposter syndrome. When you start to realize that some that the people that are speaking on stage have imposter syndrome, just like you, we're just uh, pretending it doesn't exist. <laughs> We're pretending that voice inside of our head doesn't exist that's saying like, why am I here? How did, why did they pick me? I have no idea. So people are also super scary. Um, they have their own egos and their wants and their needs and they bring things to the table that um, confuse us and uh, are uh, different from what we are trying to do. Um, it seems like we have nothing in common with the lady who like makes her own dolls out of like <laughs> knitting or something. Like we we may have nothing in common with these people, but we can learn how to connect with them, even though we seemingly have nothing in common. So a lot of us have social phobias, social anxieties, and small talk feels kind of icky. We don't like networking. It's kind of gross. Um, so we can get over that. Many of us had it have innate challenges dealing with other humans, um, being on the spectrum, being poorly socialized. Um, we The same thing that makes us good at what we do is also a little bit of a hindrance sometimes when it comes to socializing. So if we can, uh, if we can fix that a little bit, we can get more things done, we can get things done easily at work, we can build relationships and um, and get anything we want, basically. So one of the problems with hacking yourself and learning anything new is that uncertainty is actually painful. The same region in our brain that tells us that we're feeling pain is the region that's activated when we f feel uncertainty. So it manifests the same way as physical pain. So a lot of people are not good with uncertainty. People like stability, people don't like change. Um, 
it really sucks. <laughs> but and but we realize that other people at work don't like this either. Other people do not like change, as we may have seen throughout your career. So office politics are also awful. Um, they are the unwritten rules that somebody gets something, somebody doesn't get something, the crew that goes to lunch together always seems to have all the cool projects to work on, um, the people that have relationships and just make a phone call can get something done a lot quicker than somebody who sends an email and has to in introduce themselves and things like that. Um, when we don't engage in politics, it makes us less productive, it lets, makes us less effective, and um, we are more likely to quit, statistically. So we should play the game. It's actually fun and rewarding, um, and we need to participate in some of these politics if we want to be effective. So every group has politics, whether it's a bake sale or um, or a boardroom, every, every group of more than two or three people has politics because um, people bring their own, like we talked about, people bring their own uh, egos and wants and needs to the table, their aspirations and agendas, and we're always going to be compromising on something. Is it going to be chocolate cupcakes or vanilla cupcakes? Is it going to be um, Cisco or Juniper? So bad politics are... <laughs> Bad politics are the politics that we um, we don't like. We don't like them because it's nasty. It's people being in it just for themselves. And we can tell that from a mile away. A, unfortunately, a lot of offices have politics that are closer to this than good politics. Um, people are sneaky. People are trying to get things under the radar. People are trying to... Um, just uh, try to climb the ladder and they're stepping on everybody on the way up. So good politics, on the other hand, we're advancing our in own interests and we're also serving a higher purpose. We are trying to make the business better. We are not neglecting other people's feelings and needs and wants. Um, we're giving recognition to people instead of uh, uh, throwing them under the bus because we want them to look bad so that we can look good. It's making sure everybody involved in something looks good because that makes us all look good. Um, weirdly enough, uh, good politics may, you may like be uh, bad mouthing the people who play bad politics. So it's kind of, kind of strange that that works. We can't be a successful island, um, especially in the, the industries that we work in. A lot of us want to sit in our basements and, and just do what we do, but that hurts our careers. That hurts our teams. It doesn't help our organization as much, um, just being a worker bee. So we have this increasingly collaborative structure at work where uh, teams are getting things done. And as Steve Jobs said, um, great things in business are never done by one person. They're done by a team of people. And that's absolutely true. Um, any project is going to involve more than one person. So influence can help you elicit changes and get things done. Um, there are a couple of different kinds of influence. There's indirect influence and there's direct influence. So direct influence is like when you're a manager and you have people under you and you have authority. Um, indirect influence is when you can uh, uh, get things done and influence people that are not directly under your authority. So that's what we're going to be talking about mostly today. Um, it's not manipulative, it's not a bad thing. We're not using social engineering to like uh, take advantage of people. We're trying to do better things for the organization. So influence requires sincerity. It's the main difference between good and bad politics. Um, it's the thing that makes us uh, trying to do networking, that's the thing that makes us feel icky, is that we don't feel sincere. We feel like we're putting on a smile, we're putting on a, a face, we're putting on a mask, um, and, and it, it's exhausting, frankly. So it, if we want to contribute to the greater good, we need to retain our sin uh, sincerity and people will be able to smell us being insincere from a mile away. If, if we're like, oh, I love your earrings, they're great. 
that's, that's a lot different than somebody who's being sincere. So people will actually respond to you better if they don't sense a hidden agenda, like within bad politics. Authenticity and sincerity go hand in hand. Um, we want to maintain this as well. Uh, this is what, um, this is how we, we see ourselves and how we present ourselves to the world. We don't want to be too different from who we are because that's also exhausting and it's not going to help us at all. So um, we need to be able to sell our value. It's really hard to be able to write like a bio of yourself or something and, and talk about all the cool things that you've done because it feels weird. It, it goes back to the um, to uh, imposter syndrome. It feels like weird that we should be talking ourselves up and it, it makes job interviews really hard and things like that. Um, you may think that I made this and it should stand on its own merits, but that's not really how things work. Um, so we have to extend our reach and our impact, and, and we do that through other people. And it does get easier to talk about yourself, and I've learned this through many job interviews that I've been going through, and through um, uh, speaking and, and submitting CFPs and things like that. Selling your value gets a lot easier when you've done it many times because you have like sort of an elevator pitch or whatever, you are more able to talk about what you contribute and how you help when you've done it before. The first few times can feel kind of difficult and icky. So asking for help is also really uncomfortable. We want to be seen as competent, we want to be seen as um, uh, confident and capable, um, and high, as high potential employees. So we don't want to ask for help. We want to be able to do it ourselves. It's part of the hacker mentality, like I can do it, uh, I can make this work. But um, asking for help is required in a lot of projects, in a lot of different efforts at work. So with SE at work, we're trying to manipulate the social and political system. Um, we need to figure out where we fit into that ecosystem. We need to convince people that they want to help us, not just convince people to help us. Um, it, it will help us get the things done quickly. Um, it will help us negotiate and help us build consensus on decisions. And most of all, and this is the best part, it will help people prioritize your tasks and your uh, efforts over others. Because ultimately, there's a human who's deciding what they're going to work on today. Are they going to work on the request from somebody they don't know, or are they going to work on the request from the person that they know is their friend, or know is doing the right thing for the company, or whatever the myriad of reasons is. So when you start to enter office politics, when you start to interact with people more, it does take courage. Um, it's, it's trying something new, it's trying something difficult. It's a lot more embarrassing if you fail, um, in theory, because it's not like your code didn't compile. It's, uh, it could lead to an awkward moment or something like that, but you will learn from that. Just like any mistake that you make, just like anything you try to do, it takes courage to start. So forget about your comfort zone. You need to, anytime you learn something like a new language, you are getting out of your comfort zone. You're trying something new. Um, our career advancement requires networking. Getting a job by just submitting a resume on a website is not as effective as when you give your resume to someone else and they get it into the system. Um, challenging situations are the situations that teach us the most. Whenever we are tried, and our metal is tried, we learn more. Um, we're always changing, so it shouldn't be too hard. And we can, just like any change, we can ease into it. We don't have to make a ton of changes at once. And we grow as people by doing things that we wouldn't normally do. So this is a good thing. People may hear your words, but they feel your attitude. This is why um, social engineering is so important. And this is why authenticity is important. So you need to decide if you really care about your own idea. 
if you have an idea for a project, if you have an idea you want to, um, to implement something or make a change, um, if you don't care about it and you can't convince others that it's important, then it's not going to happen. So you need to decide why it's important to you, why you value the decision, and why other people should believe in it as well. When we have zero political skills, it undermines people like us, intelligent, honest, hardworking people. So we need to be able to play politics without losing ourselves. We want to stay authentic. We want to stay sincere. So we're going to do just like we would do with any kind of <laughs> attack, and I hate to say this, but it is very much like an attack. Um, so we're going to try to understand what's going on at work. We're going to, um, to implement some, some different uh, tactics to try to make things happen. So recon and then infiltrate. So we're going to start by mapping the humans. We can do this on paper. We can do this in Maltigo. We can do it um, however we want. So we're going to do some intelligence gathering. We're going to look at who the stakeholders are um, in the entire organization, not just relevant to your project, but relevant to things that you would normally try to do. So um, we're going to look at uh, who the stakeholders are. Is it legal? Is it, um, is it the developers? Is it um, operations? We need to figure out who the, the stakeholders are. And then within those stakeholder groups, we have to figure out who has influence. And it may not be the people with direct influence. It may not be the managers. It might be um, a senior person that uh, everybody looks to uh, to make good decisions. And then we need to figure out how people are associated, who's friends with who, what, what are the groups, what are the cliques, um, who talks to each other regularly. And we can do this by observation. Um, we can talk to people and try to figure out what's going on. A lot of people know the, the system better than you would. So we recon the relationships between people. Um, we need to figure out how uh, decisions are going to be made. Are they made in the meeting or are they made after a discussion is in the meeting at, via email or something like that? Um, do people hate meetings? Is it better to uh, just have informal conversations? It also introverts. Do they not want to communicate in a very personal way? Um, and look for people who are well connected because they can help you. So with formal channels of communication, we want to try to figure out um, uh, are meetings like just talks or are you going to need to present? Um, are you going to be more, do you need to be more prepared? Um, do you need to have like slide decks and things like that or is it more impromptu? Um, you can also ask colleagues who have recently or in the past had success getting things done how they did it and get some information from that. In terms of decisions, decisions get made in different ways. So sometimes they're made in the meeting, sometimes after. Um, sometimes uh, uh, the senior people are agreeing to things rather than management, um, even without like checking with management necessarily. Um, you can look around, uh, if you're in person, you can look around and, or even on the phone, try to figure out is everybody agreeing or is it just a few people that are agreeing? Are, are some people staying silent? Um, you, talk to them afterwards and try to figure out did they agree and that's why they were silent or did, were they silent because they disagreed but they didn't want to because it wasn't the popular opinion? So also in, uh, in-person meetings, people might physically look to someone when a decision needs to be made. That person is an influencer. If, if people tur turn their bodies or ask, well, what do you think uh, to somebody, that person is important. That person is an influencer. So once we know who's in the organization, who the stakeholders are, um, we know who is making decisions, uh, who's informal, um, we, we want to start to think about how we're implementing the change that we want to make. So in any change, there's going to be kind of a winner and a loser, and, and there's people that are going to have to do more work. There's going to be people that have to contribute more resources, um, and there's people that are going to uh, have a better day. So try to figure out who's going to uh, have more work, who's going to 
um, be on the kind of bearing the brunt of the change because it, that's going to be important later to try to help them ease into the change. So there's going to be advocates, there's going to be blockers. Try to think ahead of time about who those people are going to be. Um, and again, you can make a visual map to help you with any of this. Um, once you have that, that's when we're going to need to infiltrate. We're going to have to start building relationships. Um, and so we want to secure allies before we need them. That's really important. So one way you can do this is to team up with somebody who's really well networked. Um, people that are well networked are not necessarily really deeply technical. Um, they, they require people who are technical to carry out their big picture visions. Um, they, uh, they tend to adopt introverts. It's kind of funny. So if you can try to find somebody that's really well networked and hang out with them and look, you can actually learn from them, but you can also use their network. When we talk about body language, this is something that we need to work on as a community. It's true. We have to admit this. 80% um, of what we understand in a conversation is the body, not the words. So if your body language doesn't convey confidence, if you're walking around and you're hunched over and you're asking for something, you're like, I really need help with this project. And, or if you have your, your arms crossed and you seem really defensive or you seem really closed off to the world, um, it's, it's going, people are going to react to that. They're going to see that. So we stand up straight, we keep our, I mean, they seem like simple things, but we project confidence by standing correctly, sitting correctly, and pitching our voice a little bit lower because when we get really excited, sometimes our voices go up like this and, and we, if we get really nervous and things like that, pitch the voice down a little bit. When we talk about um, mirroring other people, you may hear about this where people, um, somebody puts their, their hand, head on their hand like this and then the person across from them might do something similar, maybe with the other hand. Um, when, if somebody has their hands crossed in front of them, uh, somebody might put their arms in a similar way. So uh, this happens naturally when we have rapport. When we don't have rapport, we can use this to build a rapport because people like people who are like them. People like people that are similar to them, including body language. So there, we can also change the way people are. So if you notice that somebody else is closed off or they have their arms crossed and they're sitting back in their chair, you can actually do the opposite. You can lean forward, you can open up, you can have open body language versus closed body language. Um, so if they are uh, like a feelings person, you can talk about feelings. Um, if they're a thinker, they'll use words like, I think. If they're a feeler person, they'll be like, I feel like this is uh, not going to work. There's different uh, personality types, so when we use words that appeal to those personality types, that's really helpful. Timing is important. So if there's something going on at the business, if there's like a big merger or something, or they're, um, a, a big customer's having like a, an outage or something, that may not be the best time to try to make change. People will stick to what they know, tried and true things. They're more likely to say no because they, they don't want to think about the implications right now. They're too busy. So try to think about um, what is going on um, in, the, in the business, maybe in the world even, uh, depending on what you do and try to find an unstressful time to suggest change. You can read the room. This is a, a little bit harder on the phone. Um, you, you can try to see if people are bored, um, if they uh, have their own uh, strife, um, if there's other things going on. Uh, is it the right time to propose an idea? Uh, are people really closed off because of something else that's being discussed that may not be the best time to propose something? Um, you can also notice how people change. If somebody walks in the room and everybody suddenly sits up straight, that person may be important, they may be an influencer, that may be a better time to suggest changes. Well, you can also use a current strife. So let's say there is an outage. Let's say that a customer is down. That may be a good time to suggest something that could help with, with this in the future. So you can either... You, by being aware of what's going on, you can either use it to your advantage 
or um, you can step back and wait until it's a better time. So empathy is so important um, in what we do. I, it does need to be authentic when we empathize with people. Um, it helps us solve problems. Uh, when people will, people will notice that, uh, that we understand them and care about them. So a couple of ways that we can do that. Something I do all the time is practice gratitude. I say thank you all the time. I will say thank you multiple times. Um, I'll say it different ways uh, over the course of an email. I will thank their boss. I will thank them. I will thank them publicly. I will thank them later when I talk to them, like, hey, thanks for that thing you did last week. Um, when we say thank you, people appreciate it. Um, people want to feel like they matter. So um, it's better to focus on their generosity and their selflessness, not on how you will benefit. Like, thanks, that that really helped me out is not quite as good as, like, thank you, you are always a great resource for me to reach out to, and I appreciate it. Kindness is another way to build empathy. Um, we need to be conscious of how we are with other people. I mean, there's always going to be somebody that didn't Google something and we're going to tell them, no, we're not going to help you, just Google that. But the way we say it can change the way people perceive it. So respecting people, being civil, um, and more than anything, holding the other people on your team accountable for kindness is, a, is critical because if people perceive your team as being kind of mean or rough or, or whatever, then they are not going to want to work with you because you're on the team. So making sure that everybody is being nice and, and helpful as much as possible and not being rude to people or uh, just saying flat out no um, without giving reasons or um, explaining things, it's, um, it, it will help everybody when everybody is being nicer. So people want to be effective. Um, it's a, a basic uh, human motivation. Um, it, we want to feel engaged. We want to have meaning in our lives. The things that we contribute make us uh, who we are. So um, when we show people that they're effective, not just tell them, um, that makes a big difference. So. Um, we, when we follow up, if somebody's helping us in as one step of a larger process, follow up and say um, that that thing that you helped with last week, uh, that helped us get this whole project going. Um, you know, you were a critical piece of that. Um, thank you. And uh, here's what happened. And it went well. Then the next time that you ask them for help, they will know that it's for something good and that they're contributing and that that will make them feel good. It's also good to uh, not tell them how to help because they may have better ideas than you on how they can help. So if you tell them what you need, uh, that's you're not going to tell them how to do it unless they, sorry, unless they, <laughs> unless they have no idea what to do. Um, you're not going to tell them how to help you. You're just going to ask for the help. So positive reinforcement is good. We look at like Pavlov's dog, that kind of thing. Um, providing recognition and st of status and achievements, really important. Like I said, emailing their boss, uh, telling them thank you for lending me the resource of this pe person, um, emphasizing that people have positive impact, uh, telling, um, uh, show not just telling, but showing people the results of what happens so that they can see the good that they do. When we really get into empathy, then we start acknowledging the things that are going to happen because of change. So um, people are going to fear the change. They're gonna, there's going to be some uncertainty, which is going to manifest as a little bit of pain, which nobody likes. So, um, so don't tiptoe around it. Address it. Say, I know that this change is going to be hard for you. Um, I know that you're going to need to devote some resources to it. So when we, as we start the plan, uh, we're going to help you. Uh, get this going because we know that you're short on resources already. So acknowledge that what's going on. Try to um, try to make their uh, understanding of how it will happen um, so a little bit smoother, so that they can uh, absorb and accept the change 
um, knowing that they'll have help. They're not just going to be like, here's something for you to do. Here's some more work. Um, being a partner is really important. So when we share things that we like and we talk to other people, it's called quid pro quo. So this is part of a natural conversation stuff. Um, I'm, I'm talking to somebody and I say, uh, I have two dogs. Um, somebody else might say that I'm talking to, they might say, oh, I have a dog too. So by me sharing something, they also shared. So this is a good way to, um, to talk to people, to learn about them. Um, if we do find out something like somebody has a dog, we want to add that to our little diagram. We want to say, here's Susie, and she has a, this kind of dog, and his name is whatever, so that we can ask them about it later. It shows that we're listening. It shows that we care, and they will respond to that. If you make a mistake, say you're sorry. It's hard. Um, I know some people that cannot apologize. Uh, it's just they, they they like physically cannot apologize for things. Um, they're never wrong, so they will not say they're sorry. So by humbling yourself and uh, suppressing your ego, you are going to um, show people that um, you are honest. You admitted that you made a mistake. You're sorry. Um, it's not going to happen again. Things like that. Um, it makes you vulnerable, and that endears people to you. It makes people um, relate to you. If you are perfect and you never make mistakes, you're harder to relate to. So um, having shared experiences, this is one of the reasons that companies do those like weird outings and stuff. But you can make that happen at work. Um, let's say that there is an outage and everybody's working on it and you order pizza. Um, that's a lot better than everybody's in their cubes working on it separately. Um, being together in that moment and having those shared experiences can help with bonding um, so that later you can talk about, hey, remember that time we stayed up all night and fixed the problem? That was, uh, those were the good old days or whatever. So we can only influence people. We can't change other people. We can change ourselves, though. So with choice architecture, this is a little bit more advanced. Um, the goal is to present only the things that you really want people to choose. So let's say that there's five or 10 or 20 choices for something. Um, you want to present the first one. Um, you want to create the illusion of choice, but you're really only presenting a, a few options that are all good options. Or you can uh, talk about the first option, the best option first because people will focus on the first thing that you talk about. So if you want to uh, nudge people towards a certain direction, don't present everything all at once. Um, it, they're comparing things. It's, it's too difficult to make a decision. Give them one idea. Say, here's one of the, uh, get, get that vendor on the phone first. Get that demo first. Because that, then everybody else will be compared to them. They will be the standard. This is, uh, we, we need to start with individuals instead of groups when we want to make change. Um, you'll see this in a lot of like, uh, House of Cards or some of the other political shows where people are trying to get votes for something. They'll call people individually and get their support so that when it does come to a vote, when it does come to a decision, those people, um, it's just a formality for approving. So, um, so when there's a commonly held opinion and you have the majority of people that are on board, you've talked to them, you've talked to them about the pluses and the minuses and how it's going to work, um, it, it's much better when you come into a room and people are on the same page. If people start talking about something that you don't like, if they start talking about uh, going down a path that you don't think will work, um, you can play devil's advocate and make them start thinking about the negatives of what they are thinking of. Are we um, making the right decision on this? Let's consider the alternatives. Um, if, we, if we don't, something bad could happen. So when people make good decisions, we want to reward them. We want to say that's an excellent uh, suggestion. That is a great idea. Do, let's do that. And, and making it so that when they are making decisions and making suggestions that help your cause, you're giving positive reinforcement for that. 
So humility, much like saying you're sorry, is important. Um, we can't always be the, um, the the people that are unapproachable and always right and uh, the best of, I mean, we may be the best at what we do, but we don't have to act that way. So when we network, um, <laughs> Networking sucks. <laughs> it's true. Um, it, it's not socializing, though. Networking is different from socializing. We're not hanging out with our friends. We're hanging out with pe people who can do something for us. They might be able to get us a job. Um, they might be able to um, help us down the line. Um, I will uh, have a conversation with anybody that wants to talk to me about a potential job or something, because even if it's not the right fit, because that way I, I have somebody who knows me who may in the future need somebody like me to, for a job. So um, when you try to socialize, or when you try to network, this is a good uh, place to try to, to uh, you know, you Google like how to make small talk, and then you try it out in like a networking setting. Um, a lot of people are very awkward in networking sessions, and um, a lot of people are really good at it too. So if you can, uh, if you go to a conference, uh, just go talk to the vendors because they're really good at talking to people. So you can you can actually listen to how like how they're questioning you, uh, the way that they're saying things, quid pro quo, things like that, um, and and get some tips on how you can be better too. You're trying something new when you do this. Don't think about it like socializing. It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable because you're going to feel inauthentic and sincere, like at least at first. But when you get to know somebody, it no, it's no longer inauthentic. It's no longer um, uh, awkward. So questions make things a lot easier. Asking a lot of questions is the key to small talk. Um, it, it helps us with pretty much everything. If I don't know what to say to somebody, I'll just ask them the question, hey, what did you do this weekend? Or if I'm at a con and I meet somebody, like, hey, what are you working on? Things like that, um, it, it, especially if it's an open-ended question, um, that's a lot better than something where they just say no, and then there's an awkward silence. So um, if you have something to add, uh, you talk about similar experiences, that creates a bond as well. So listening actively is important. Um, when somebody says, uh, so I went to the Bahamas last weekend, you go, Oh, you went to the Bahamas last weekend. That's awesome. So you're repeating what they said to show that you were listening. Um, nodding, mirroring body language, things like that. We talked about open body language as well helps. Uh, not using your phone as well. Um, Open-ended questions again. Here are some examples. Are you originally from here? What do you do? What do you do on the weekends? Um, uh, what are you looking forward to on the three-day weekend? Things like that. So. When we ask for help, we want to shift the idea to the benefits of helping, how good they're going to feel when they help, how uh, how impactful they're going to be. So they should feel in charge or in control of their decision, feel like they have a choice in whether they're going to help you or not. And um, and by having a relationship before you need something, it really primes them for helping you. So you, if you go into it and you're introducing yourself, it's already too late. You should already have some sort of rapport with people that you're going to be asking for things throughout your career. So don't suggest that somebody is instructing them to help. So um, you can uh, use the authority principle of social engineering, like my boss really needs me to get this done. Um, that's not as effective as saying, um, my manager said that you were the best at this and to involve you because uh, they knew that you would uh, be a huge help. So um, may I ask you a favor? It makes people feel trapped. There are some different questioning lines that you can go through. Um, uh, if you minimize your need, that's really, um, really bad. If you're like, uh, I, I hate to ask you this or this is just a little thing because then nobody's going to want to help you. Being too vulnerable can actually backfire too. It can make people not respect you. Um, so don't ask for help when you when you don't really need it. It's like the Google it first. Um, and it's also a fine line between being completely helpless and asking for help. When we use the word together, 
it is impactful to our brains because we are tribal originally. So um, being part of that tribe makes us succeed. We want the entire organization to succeed. So uh, citing common goals, common enemies, um, uh, creating a strong sense of group is important when we try to elicit change. Several smaller meetings with individuals will help us more than uh, a couple of larger meetings. Um, being positive, one-on-one -on -one conversations, trying to get things um, uh, rolling with, uh, with influencers. Um, we always want to meet the expectations. If we say we're going to do something, we do it. Um, that builds trust. So we have to build these relationships. If we don't, we're going to be less effective. People will resist change, so expect it and prepare to answer questions and deal with uh, complaints and things like that. When you think about what the possible uh, arguments are going to be against your suggestion, then you can actually have responses ready when you go into it. Um, you want to give people, uh, with change you want to let it kind of trickle in, you want it to um, uh, like slowly build change. We're not saying like we're going to change everything about the network tomorrow, like that doesn't work. So we, we plant the seed of an idea and then we ease people into it. Um, we talked about how some people will be winners and losers. Um, we can uh, try to um, we can try to build like a prototype of something if people don't think it will work. So we can get uh, mass support and we will um, be able to get others to follow because that's how social proof works. If everybody says that 2 plus 2 is 4, then the other person is probably going to say the same thing. Um, be prepared to state your case. Be prepared to deal with arguments. Show respect and empathy when people are disagreeing because they, are, um, they need to understand that you are um, on their side. When you get nervous, don't overexplain. Um, just state, state, the, the, state your case. State uh, the argument to their argument. Don't attack back. Um, it, try to stay positive. What is stopping you from saying yes is a really powerful phrase. Um, car dealers use it all the time, but you can use it uh, to figure out what, what people are thinking about how um, about what you're suggesting. So if there are arguments, you can address them then rather than let it fester and you don't know about it. Some people just won't care. Um, so changing yourself is the only option. You can escalate up and over and use the management chain. Um, it, it, I've also used FOMO to try to get people on projects and things like that. Um, if they feel like they're going to be left out of some big successful project, they will want to participate. So um, we need to be sincere and honest, building trust, try not to lose it, uh, cultivating relationships, not being afraid to uh, take risks sometimes, admitting our mistakes, letting others win sometimes. We don't always have to be the winner. Um, valuing people, setting aside our egos, asking for advice, and looking outward, trying new things, interacting with people, attempting to do, do, uh, do things differently than you normally do. Um, remote work does make this a lot harder. Um, you, what I usually do is show up a few minutes early for a meet, like a phone call or phone bridge and just make some small talk. Um, if you run a team, talk about some personal stuff before uh, the meeting starts or after. Um, and, and if I'm like chatting with somebody, I will continue to talk to them after they've helped me. I'll be like, so I haven't talked to you in a while. How are things going over there? It's just a simple thing. It's just a simple way to keep conversations going. You can reach out just to touch base. You don't always have to ask for something. In fact, that's probably better. Um, having a, a more... Uh, fun environment where you're like sharing uh, gifts and emojis and things like that can also help. So bringing it all together, um, we have to acknowledge that politics exist and that we have to participate in them. Um, we can fake it till we make it. A lot of us are pretty good at that. Um, we manage the network of influencers that we've discovered and uh, can, can use to our advantage. 
We build influence before we need it, not after, or not when. Um, and socializing and networking and all these things, it sets us up for good things in the future. It's not just necessarily with making change, but also in our careers and our lives. Authenticity makes networking not completely awful when we uh, maintain who we are. And then we can craft outcomes with things like choice architecture and nudging. So some books that have helped me, um, this is on my blog at architectsecurity.org, um, and I will tweet it out after. Uh, so that's my thing. Thank you. <laughs>